So thank you, everybody. Um, thank you for joining this uh, chocolate webinar. Um, you will see uh, during this uh, session today, we will raise a lot of different topics. Uh, so I'm going to present you, uh, of course, uh, the uh, Earthworm Foundation for those who, who don't know us. Um, we will also give brief uh, charcoal uh, context about the issues around this commodity. Uh, we will present you also in more details the uh, Earthworm Foundation charcoal program, uh, the link between this commodity and the potential imported deforestation. Uh, we will also give you the results of our analysis on the uh, 2021 customs data on the European market, and also our results on the uh, charcoal bags analysis. So uh, we bought a lot of charcoal bags uh, on the European market and opened them, and uh, we will give you our results on that. After this first uh, um, part of the presentation, we will have a short discussion break. So 10 minutes to raise your questions about the first part, and then we will jump into the uh, second part of the presentation. We will present you our, uh, our, carbon, our charcoal and carbon forest footprint calculation, and also the uh, new stuff that we put on our uh, CTI platform, which is our one of our main tools and uh, where we can publish all the results of our of our work on it. And finally, we will give you our conclusions and recommendations. And of course, we will have some time to discuss about the, the rest of the presentation. So here's the uh, the charcoal team. I meant one. Uh, nice to uh, to uh, do this webinar with you. And my dear colleagues, Pierre Olivier and Robin, will uh, join me uh, during the presentation. So for those who don't know us, Earthworm has been funded in 1999. Um, we've been working a lot. Uh, so on first, uh, we were known as a TFT, so Tropical Forest Trust, and now Earthworm Foundation. Um, the uh, organization has grown a lot in 20 uh, years because now we, uh, we have more than 100 members and we have the expertise on social and environmental issues. We work around the globe. Uh, we are uh, 250 people in around uh, 18 countries. Our main work is focused on the, on the supply chains. Uh, so uh, we try to uh, make supply chains more responsible from uh, environmental and uh, social point of view. Um, so we try to bring transparency to work on policies uh, with the companies and uh, also to, uh, to fund um, transformation programs into, uh, into the supply chains. Our offices are located, uh, well, most part of the globe where uh, we can have uh, deforestation or degradation. Uh, we, uh, the charcoal team, are mainly based in, uh, in the Lille office in France. And as I told you, uh, Tropical Forest Trust was funded in 1999 around the uh, tropical wood. Um, but uh, unfortunately, also, uh, you know that now there are a lot of different drivers of deforestation. So this is why also now our work is focused on a lot of different commodities. So we're not working only on, uh, on charcoal and wood, but we're also working a lot on palm oil, on uh, pulp and paper, on seafood. We have a big soy program also in France. And just to give you briefly, uh, my colleague Pierre Olivier will uh, will show you the uh, charcoal program. But just to give you a short story of the uh, of the charcoal work we do, uh, we have now 15 members and partners who work with us on the charcoal program. Uh, we do it for more than eight years now. Uh, we launched the first uh, charcoal bags analysis in 2015, and we launched uh, our charcoal transparency platform in uh, yeah three years ago which was a very big achievement. And uh, from 2020, we launched the uh, charcoal transparency survey. I'm going to jump on that in more details uh, after that, presenting the, the platform. And so when we are talking about charcoal, of course, uh, summer is coming. So we are talking about charcoal we put in our barbecues, but uh, there are a lot of different uses uh, in the world uh, through uh, the industry, the steel industry, the silicon, which is not uh, really known actually, but uh, also we use a lot of charcoal in silicon. Bioshar, which is a raising topic now uh, with all the uh, carbon uh, storage uh, matter. 
And uh, we use it also, we often uh, forget that, but a lot of people, millions of people are relying on this, uh, on this uh, commodity just to, uh, to cook and to heat uh, their homes. And we estimate that uh, under uh, 52 million tons are produced per year. So what are the challenges among uh, charcoal? Uh, well, there are a lot. <laughs> so from, uh, there are three different uh, dimensions on the, uh, the issues we can find around this commodity. The first around the uh, forest and environment. Um, we have to know that uh, depending on the technology and there are a lot of different technologies in charcoal, you need between four to, 20 to 12 tons of wood in order to make one single ton of charcoal. So of course, uh, it also spread a lot of uh, GAG emissions between two and seven regarding the uh, wood energy, including charcoal. And this is also subject to forest degradation and deforestation, even with, if we are more talking about degradation nowadays. From a social point of view, uh, there are also high risk of forced labor, violation of human rights, land in the conflicts and also missing occupational health and safety uh, during the work, during the charcoal production. And from an economical point of view, last but not least, uh, there are also risks of unfair payment, debt bondage, and missing legal regulations. So we try to work among the uh, supply chain uh, from the uh, charcoal producers to the retailers in order to, uh, to help this, uh, this uh, industry to, uh, to change for, for the best. Uh, another really important topic, why also uh, all these issues I've, I've raised in among the charcoal industry um, is that, uh, first of all, this is an unregulated uh, commodity. This is not entering the UTR, uh, so the, um, the timber regulation. And so, of course, uh, it is a potential of uh, a lot of, uh, of um, of uh, imports uh, of, uh, for example, in, in Europe, we consume 1 million tons of uh, charcoal every year, but we only produce uh, 300,000 tons. So there are 700,000 tons uh, coming to the European market without any regulation. So of course it can raise a lot of problems. And I let uh, Pierre-Olivier. Many thanks, uh, Antoine. So yes, I'm going to present you briefly the charcoal program more in detail that Antoine briefly mentioned. So um, we indeed, we, we the program started in 2012 and we back in 2014, we start to do really to develop a, a field assessment called charcoal control system. So, so far we did roughly uh, more than 300 visits or in 20 different uh, countries. And this uh, charcoal system um, evaluates over, over, the, over the, the time. So we are version 12 or something like that. Back in 2014, 15, we bring to the market the charcoal analysis. So we really start by, we, we are not laboratory and we are absolutely not like a Paul Curtin Institute. We, are, we just bring information. So we did uh, visual density uh, and uh, visual recognition. And we bring that in back in 2015. Two years, 1.5, two years after, other people like Tunan Institute and WWF did in a lot of information about this PACS analysis. So it was just the first start. But as we started to do it, we always do it every year. And we so, so we have a we can have some visibility about the evolution of the market. And um, as uh, Antoine mentioned, we launched in 2019 the charcoal transparency initiatives, uh, a platform uh, that enabled to communicate the level of responsibility on, of each charcoal bag uh, on the market. So, and uh, every year we change, and now we're gonna present you, Antoine will present you the, the new version and uh, also uh, some surprises. Uh, on the next slide, uh, here we, here on this slide, you see a little bit uh, the overall vision of, of the program which is uh, engaging the retailer on the four 
main criteria of what we call responsible charcoal. So, and the value, you can see the VTTV cycle. It's the same model that we use to do every year. So, uh, with all the member, but we have the transparency and, and the value of responsible charcoal uh, definition. We have the transparency, respect of human rights, respect of, um, of uh, the nature means uh, forest um, wood coming from uh, well-managed forest, and also the technology, which is key, as Antoine was, was mentioning, because you need a lot of wood to produce a lot of uh, to produce charcoal. So if you use a better technology, then you have less impact on climate. Second element is the transparency. So we go with our members, we go with the partners to do the transparency aspect. So with the retailers we work with, we ask for transparency at the carbonization plant and we do risk analysis. And with the producer importers, we go on the ground to do this field assessment and we launch behind all the field assessment we have, we have a continuous improvement methodology to enable to transform positively the supply chain. So, so, and after that, when we did the assessment, we explain the scoring on the platform so that everyone can be, can be informed about the level of responsibility of the charcoal product. So behind charcoal product, you may have a lot of supply chain. So we try to make it as simple as possible uh, this year again. And also consumer can access, can get access to information in scanning the QR code. So that's the overall vision of the program. And, um, and uh, yes, we, we work, what, what, what is key is to understand is that we work all around the supply chain. So, uh, and we, and we, are, we have a methodology which is beyond the certification. So it means that we, we go and we identify the nodes all over the supply chain. So you can see on the left side, the retailers, in the middle, the importers, and on the right side, the importers, the, the producers, sorry. And we develop this VTTV model all over the supply chain. Next, please. So, here, we just wanted to point out the key point of, of the charcoal industry. Charcoal industry uh, is, uh, we, cannot, we can have a traceability if we can reconnect where the wood is transformed into charcoal. It's a key point. So if uh, all over in this field methodology, we develop several control points all over the supply chain, to trace it back the charcoal back to the forest. Uh, it's from a financial point of view, it's not interesting to transform, uh, to, to move charcoal, um, to move charcoal, uh, to move wood to transform charcoal. Sorry. What is important to what is, what is key is to uh, to uh, to have the full vision of the supply chain and good control point. So for instance, uh, we have different control points. Uh, we calculate the different volumes of the wood incoming, producing, exporting, and through that, we have a, a good visibility of the supply chains. Mm, next, please. Um, again, here, it's, it's the same, it's to explain the, the model of what we do on the ground. So we, you have the sustainable, we assess the four criteria of the sustainable, uh, responsible charcoal, so sustainable management forest, uh, production, transparency, and social aspect. And here you can see on the left side that you have the production site and we try to reconnect with the origin of the forest. 
That's for the methodology we, we set up on the ground. Um, so here, um, we wanted to address the char link with charcoal and imported deforestation. Um, this is we did, and it is uh, Lucas, which is not here today, but he, he did this uh, excellent work, and also with, with Robin as well, uh, to, to estimate, to do an estimation of the charcoal footprint and the link potential with deforestation and uh, forest degradation. So why we did this, uh, this work was in order to address the issue to the European institution and to calculate, to estimate, estimate the percentage of charcoal coming from related deforestation importation uh, in entering into Europe. So we did a uh, wood charcoal footprint in order to give a, a picture. So we have, you know, you have this amount, you need one ton to produce, uh, to, you need four to 12 tons of wood to produce one ton of charcoal. So we calculate this wood equivalent and it gives you this around these figures. So on the next slide, you will see a little bit the, the explanation of what it is. So you can see on the left side, the different imports. So as Antoine was saying, there is uh, roughly 700,000 tons of charcoal imported. On this amount, we estimate, we estimate that potentially 325,000 tons come from high risk countries with related high risk of deforestation. We don't say that all of these are related to deforestation. We say that it, there is a possibility or probability. So we did this estimation on the, on the left side. So you, after that, you have the technology, the technology and uh, the, the, to calculate the yield. And it gives us a wood equivalent uh, in tons of food. So 2 million tons of food. Then we use another convection factor uh, in the, uh, we use another convection factor and it gives us this amount of hectares of forest impacted. So we did, uh, we did that in order to address the issue and to say this is potentially the, this is potentially the, 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 the impact on charcoal related to deforestation within the uh, European Union. The next slide, one, merci. So this uh, slide is in order to compare the different, the, the different commodities related to um, deforestation, the, to imported deforestation. So on the right side, you can see the, that you have different commodities like biomole, soy, beef, cocoa, coffee. And this was, it was an estimation, uh, a, a study uh, that was used by the European Commission. Based on this estimation, we gave this first indication of the impact of charcoal production on forests. So these figures gives 17,000 uh, hectares which means that charcoal can be quite significant, but not of the charcoal production is linked to deforestation and degradation. So that's, that's just an estimation. And this element has been given to European institution in order to raise awareness about the potential link between charcoal and deforestation. Now I'm gonna give the mic to uh, Robin to present uh, the European uh, charcoal market data we did every year. Thank you, Pierre Olivier. Um, yes, so every year we look at market data from publicly available sources to analyze trends and changes on imports and production within the EU market. And this helps us see which are biggest exporting countries to the EU, for example, and uh, what the gap is compared to what we produce. So on this first graph, 
we can see uh, what are the average charcoal imports over the years from 2010 to 2020. And we see what the gap is with EU production. So imports are in orange, production is in dark gray. And what we consume is estimated uh, as that gray line up on top. And basically the main, the main um, message here is to say that we import pretty much 70% of all the charcoal we consume in the EU and that the uh, demand way is bigger than the availability of responsible charcoal on the market. Here we briefly outline which are the biggest EU countries, biggest EU consumers. Um, we see that Germany, France and the UK are the top three consumers of charcoal followed by Spain, Italy, Poland, etc. In this slide, we have the top exporters to the EU um, in tons of charcoal. Between 2013 and 2021, we have the trends of how this has evolved between the different countries. So um, the graph is, is filtered from left to right, from the biggest exporters to the EU to the smallest in 2021. We can see that Ukraine, Namibia, and Cuba remain the biggest exporters and uh, to the EU this last year. And that these three all have kind of increasing trends, except for Ukraine, which has seen a slight decrease in the last two, three years. Uh, Nigerian charcoal imports have dropped significantly. They used to be a lot higher, but they are still fourth biggest um, exporter to the EU for charcoal. Other imports from Indonesia, Paraguay, Argentina, and South Africa have decreased significantly. I just want to say that the, the numbers that you see in red, these are from 2013 to 2021, not from 2020 to 2021. So these are the general trends over the last 10 years. Ukraine is Europe's biggest charcoal exporter. Um, in this slide, we can briefly see that uh, how the evolution <clears throat> has changed over the last 20 years, a bit like the slide before. And we can see that uh, there was kind of in 2016, 17, there was a bit of a wake up call in the European charcoal market of all the tropical timber that was used to create charcoal for the EU. And uh, after that, a lot of sources have been moved from tropical sources to temperate origin. And that mainly meant that Ukraine started producing a lot more charcoal for the European market. We can see on the right briefly also a graph that shows where most of the charcoal uh, from Ukraine goes to, Poland being by far the biggest importer. <clears throat> uh, this slide shows how Nigeria, who is the fourth biggest exporter to Europe, how the trends from of exports from Nigeria to Europe have evolved, but also knowing that Nigeria has had a charcoal export ban uh, implemented by the government in 2015. So theoretically, all charcoal that comes in from Nigeria is illegal. However, exports have continued, imports to the EU uh, have continued. And we can see that there's a big difference between what is reported import data from the EU in orange and what is reported export data uh, in uh, dark gray above. We can see that the reported export data is virtually inexistent, but the EU still imports a lot of charcoal from Nigeria, even though these trends have been going down since 2019. Next slide, please. Um, Pierre-Olivier, would you like to pick it up on the Namibian charcoal supply chain? Yes. Yes, yes, we, we wanted to, to raise uh, a little bit the Namibian charcoal supply chain to explain a little bit what we did and what are the challenges related to uh, the Namibian charcoal supply chains. Because as you can see, it's a big trend and uh, we also consider that it can be uh, sustainable, um, sustainable charcoal uh, coming from the forest, from a forest point of view, in order to limit the imported deforestation uh, entering into, into uh, European Union. Um, so here, you, you, you can see here the, 
the visibility of the supply chain. On the left side, you have the workers, so roughly 10,000 workers. Then you have farmers, 800 farmers, and then you have processors, and then you have traders, and then you have the retailers. Um, here, what, what, you, what you can see here that the, the, there is a, a significant increase over the, the last years to, uh, of uh, imports and entering of, of export of Namibian entering in, in Europe. And, um, and if we consider that, uh, that the charcoal coming from Namibia can be quite responsible from a forest point of view because it's, uh, it's, it's normal savanna. It used to be a normal savanna. And here you have a phenomenon in Namibia of bush encroachment phenomenon, mean that uh, you have acacia mellifera, acacia reficiens, uh, and, uh, and this reserve of biomass is expanding and it's not, it cannot really be considered as forest. So uh, we consider that using this biomass can be sustainable. Yet we also have, we also, and it can be sustainable only if, I want to insist, only if it respects uh, what FSC does on the ground, the FSC Namibian standard, which is really robust and really good from a forest point of view. And also it improved a lot uh, from a social point of view as well. So the challenge is how we can ensure environmental and social compliance with this complexity of the supply chains. Next slide, please. So as, as I was mentioning, you can see the train of uh, export entering into uh, Europe. And uh, over the recent years, we really focus our attention to, to go more uh, to the farms and to the workers to go where there is no really, uh, let's say, there is no really, uh, there are a huge range of improvement, I would say, related to, to this aspect. On the next slide. Um, as you can see, most of the charcoal was uh, entering into Europe is roughly FSC. We estimate 70% of FSC charcoal coming from Namibia entering into Europe to be checked. And uh, you can see the growth, the growth of the numbers of farms that have been certified over the, the two, three years. And, um, I, and when you see this growth, uh, you can expect that it makes takes time to be implemented. Please, next slide. So what we did on the ground, and we were, for instance, with Antoine uh, on field and uh, with Lucas as well on field, uh, with our members, we go on the ground and we checked, uh, we go really to assess a lot of farms and meet a lot of workers. We conducted a lot of workers interview, we visit the farm, and we considered, we find that even if all the farm were FSC certified, there was, there was some element of point to improve related to the FSC certification. PPE six, for instance, six of 19 farm have not PPE. Uh, a lot of English workers have, have been there. There were, there were also issues related to grievance mechanisms. And um, I'm not going to explain and there was also issue related to the housing. So there was, there was some challenges, but um, we also want to mention that even if there was some challenges on the ground, the FSC standard has, is really robust and it's really important to, uh, <laughs> is really important to, to support. Uh, here. And we support strongly the FSC, the FSC, uh, the FSC uh, system on the ground. Yet the implementation, implementation strongly need to be reinforced. We've seen not acceptable, not acceptable situation in the FSC farms. And we address it and we ask for change related to that. So we strongly support, but in parallel, we also give uh, we full transparency on this to say, okay, 
it's good, the standard is really good, but the implementation needs really to be reinforced, training needs to be done, and control should be reinforced. So what is also key is that FSC needs support. So, uh, and they need support at all level from, uh, sorry. There is a lot of chat. I, I'm I'm confused with the chat. Can yeah, you so, sorry, Pierre, but uh, sorry to rush you a little bit, but we are we're going here. Uh, okay, we move. I move. Okay, <laughs> last slide. Sorry. Last next slide, please. Yeah. So, what we want to address here that uh, only fourteen, in average, fourteen percent of the value goes to farmers and to workers, where the main challenges are. This value needs to be given through FSC, through uh, this farm. So it means that the, the price and price of FSC need to be higher, need to be higher to support, to support the farms and the, the farms and the workers on the ground and to support all these changes, housing, PPE, uh, and it's a way to improve the system on the ground. If the, the costs, if the price for FSC is too low, it, it can create, a, it can give not confidence to farmer to be in the system, and it can affect, it can affect the robustness and the credibility of the system. So here we want, I just want here to point an alert on this, FSC price for Namibia needs to be higher and all the supply chains, all over the supply chain, buyers need to support it. So, and why they, they do it? It's in order to improve the grievance mechanism and in order to improve the living condition. Thank you. Robin. Thank you, Pierre. All right. Uh, so in summary of this market data, now can you just go back to the other slide? Yeah. Sorry, Ro. No problem. So in summary of the market data piece of this uh, webinar, um, we can see that Europe's charcoal imports have tripled over the last 20 years and are an important commodity for Europeans. But um, at the moment, they remain pretty much stable compared to the amount of production there is in the country, which means 70% imported, 30% produced. Uh, there is an ever-increasing ever there are never ever increasing charcoal imports from Namibia. Nigerian charcoal imports have significantly, have significantly decreased, but are still present, even though they are supposedly illegal. Um, Poland, we will see in the next part, and Ukraine remains European, Europe's major supplier for charcoal. Next slide, please. Okay, so now to the charcoal bags analysis. Um, what this is, is every year since 2015, we purchase charcoal bags from various shops in a specific country of interest, and we look at what wood species can be found inside. We can distinguish between tropical and temperate wood species and between species of temperate wood. So we can distinguish oak from beech, for example. So how we do this is we look at the density of the charcoal, usually tropical, charcoal having a higher density than temperate wood, as well as the structure of the growth rings and wood vessels that are still apparent even after carbonization of wood into charcoal. Other indicators of where the charcoal was packed, such as pieces of stone or plastic are also observed. Then we look at what is written on the bag, if we can find any indication of origin or certification and uh, a few other little pieces of information that we pick up. So why we do this is, well, we've been doing this since 2015, as we mentioned before. And the goal is to show what is in the charcoal bags of retailers and shops so that they are aware of maybe the opacity that can be in their products. Often there, are, there can be tropical wood without any origin indicated. Um, and so, yeah, that's the main reason. Yeah, just on the, below, you have one example uh, for three different countries of where we've been doing most charcoal bags analysis. These aren't the only ones, but you can see that Germany, Poland, and France have been our main focus. 
So here I will be talking about what findings we have from this year from Germany and Poland, uh, briefly over three main indicators. The first one being the declared country of origin. So this is looking at the charcoal bag, seeing if there's any single declaration of country of origin or production of the charcoal. And, we can, and we've been noting down since uh, 2015 uh, where, like, what percentage of bags have had any indication of origin. We can see that for Germany, uh, the declared origin started to go up, but then decreased again after 2019 since the COVID pandemic. And in uh, 2022, 67% of all analyzed samples had no indication on the origin of the product printed on the bags. In Poland, uh, Poland, which is a very big producer of charcoal for Europe, which is why it's a country of interest for us, and also a, a transit hub, as we will see later. Um, Poland had a large increase from 21 to 22 of declared country of origin. However, often these declarations say, for example, made in Poland, but can contain tropical species. It doesn't mean they don't necessarily say that the wood comes from Poland, but if the product says made in Poland, this can mis mislead the, the consumer. Next slide, please. Um, next indication of opacity is looking at what species of wood is in the charcoal bag, so temperate tropical or sometimes mixed. And so similar, we believe that similarly to a food product, the consumer should be given the opportunity to know which <clears throat> species of wood are contained in the, the charcoal bag so that they are aware of where it actually comes from. In Germany, um, after a decrease in tropical species found in samples, we saw an increase again this year. 36% of the samples contained tropical charcoal did not indicate wood or production site origin. In Poland, we also saw an increase again in tropical wood species since uh, last year. And 95% uh, of the bags containing tropical charcoal did not indicate wood or production site origin. And four bags, as I mentioned before, even mentioned made in Poland, but still contained tropical wood. Finally, we also looked at certification and how certification has evolved over time in the different markets. This is interesting for us also because it kind of indicates how consumers um, are becoming more or less uh, demanding on responsible products in the market. And we can see that overall there is a general increase in FSC <clears throat> sorry, FSC certification in both markets and in Poland. It's very new, but it's coming. However, yeah, we'd like to uh, we'd like to say just before that even though certification is a good tool and we do recommend it rather than non-certified products, uh, it cannot be considered foolproof of, as fraud still exists within the different markets. And uh, we have been working with FSC and on, on addressing these issues in, in some countries. Next slide, please. So in summary for the charcoal bags analysis, after an increase um, between 2015 and 2020, the declared origin of the products has been decreasing since 2020, especially in the German market. In the Polish market, although a lot of bags mention where they are made, they, are rarely, they rarely indicate where the wood is actually from. And this is because a lot of charcoal is actually packed in Poland from different countries and then redistributed. And this is why we call Poland a transit hub for charcoal. The amount of certified products have been increasing, showing a demand for consumers for more responsible products. And the amount of tropical charcoal from uh, Namibia and Cuba specifically is increasing. Okay, guys, uh, dear timekeeper, Pierre, I don't know if we <laughs> still have time for a little Q&A session of 10 minutes. <clears throat> Before we, we are not so bad. We are not so bad. Okay. We are almost on time. I think uh, thanks to Robin and you. <laughs> Great.
<laughs> okay, uh, so I don't know if we answered all the questions that have been raised into the uh, chat uh, box, but uh, if anyone has a, a question about uh, what we presented to you um, or any remark, uh, we are happy to, uh, to answer now for this 10-minute uh, session, and then we go back to the presentation. You can, uh, you if you want, uh, we we don't record the questions. Yes, you're right, Pierre. Thank you. You were. And we can go to the other slides. Okay. Um, now an introduction of something new that we've been working on over the last year at uh, the charcoal team. So we're talking about the charcoal carbon and forest footprint, what we call the CCFF. Basically, as a quick introduction, charcoal, which is a carbon-rich fuel created by heating wood in low oxygen environment, releases a lot of greenhouse gases to produce and obviously to burn afterwards. But a publication from the FAO showed that up to 80% of greenhouse gases in the charcoal value chain are due to unsustainable wood sourcing, uh, the use of low efficient carbonization technologies and combustion together. So that's what we represent here in the graph below is that people sometimes omit the fact that unsustainable wood sourcing has a much bigger impact on climate than sustainable wood sourcing and uh, low impact uh, sustainable forestry. Mm, yep. Thanks. Um, so we, what we did is we created a tool to calculate the estimated charcoal carbon and forest footprint to help companies visualize the estimated impact and transition towards more sustainable practices. So it is basically a quite a simple tool. Um, it helps us calculate the carbon footprint, which means the tons of CO2 equivalent per ton of charcoal produced and then also the forest footprint, which is not something that we are necessarily advertising yet, but it's estimating the number of trees or forest surface area needed to offset the emissions caused by the charcoal. So this can also be used if uh, for compensation projects, for example. So what we measure, uh, we'll go back to the last slide, please. What we measure is scope one emissions, which means the production process and the most impactful scope three emissions, meaning forest degradation, uh, impact forestry machinery, transport and combustion. And this together <clears throat> um, covers an estimated 80% of all the emissions in the charcoal value chain. Next slide, please. So I wanna just say that it covers an, an estimated 80%. This is a very, high level estimation of the of the carbon impact of charcoal it is not a precise uh, measurement the goal is just to give us an idea of where the production stands um, based on the most impacting factors so here we have nope sorry sorry so here we have a compare a comparison of carbon footprints of various sources so if we have a local production from responsibly forests and a high yield, high, highly efficient technology, which reuses the pyrolysis gases and which uses a small amount of wood to make one ton of charcoal, then the relative impact, climate impact is quite low. Whereas if we're from an area with high deforestation risk, with uh, irresponsible or illegal logging, uh, low efficiency, uses a lot of wood, then obviously, and plus there's the transport associated to bringing charcoal from the other side of the world. And obviously the, the CO2 impact will be a lot higher. Next slide, please. So how we've been scoring this, uh, this, this CCFF scores um, for the different charcoal productions, you can see here a score from A to E, kind of like they have in a lot of European countries now when they score food products. Um, I try to give an equivalency on the table on the right to what this represents. I, it's, it's a bit 
all over the place. I'm sorry about that because it's kind of hard to find equivalents for, for fuels. But um, basically we have A being low carbon footprint, which is like burning uh, firewood from that are just leftover branches. Then we have D and E, which are high carbon footprint, which is more like burning mineral coal or uh, eating uh, red meat, for example, which is highly, <clears throat> uh, highly impactful in terms of climate. So to improve the score from A to E, what's necessary is that charcoal needs to be produced locally with an efficient technology and from wood harvested responsibly or from wood waste from sawmills and not wood that is either illegally logged or from areas that are deforested just for charcoal, for example. Um, just wanted to add one more thing is that we use our field expert, our field visits to gather data to implement into the CCFF for the different production sites. Um, if we don't have field data, we use averages by knowing where the charcoal comes from in terms of country, et cetera. And obviously the more we use averages, the higher the score, meaning the more data we have, usually the lower the charcoal impact because we can have more precise information. Thank you, Roman. So, um, getting back to the uh, charcoal transparency initiative, so we have made uh, a lot of different improvements during the past year, and uh, you will see that um, the platform has been a little bit modified, uh, as I would say. Um, so now just going for those who don't know the charcoal transparency initiative is a website dedicated to uh, uh, both b2b and b2c uh, b2b because we can uh, enter a lot of different information about the supply chains about the different work we do on the field etc and uh, also from the b2c side it enables people uh, for the members who have completed a lot of different uh, uh, proof uh, proof readings and a lot of different uh, assessments that they can tell the story of the product and communicate it to the uh, to the customers via the uh, QR code. So what has changed? Uh, so as uh, Robin said, we were going to uh, implement uh, a more uh, A to E uh, score because also this is the, 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 the trend uh, in, uh, in a lot of different products. So now when you look at a product, you have this A to E, uh, the A++ to E uh, rank. And this rank is uh, separated uh, between three different uh, segments. So the first one, the most important, is the field observations, uh, representing 60% of this uh, score. The second one is the transparency score with the 20% of the share. And the last one, the 20% are from the carbon score, as Robin explained to you with our CCFF method. So the three big pillars of our work, and this is why the CTI is also a new, very important tool, is because it enables us to centralize all this information, all the, the expertise we've made on the field and all the different assessments we've done, either documentary and, uh, and also in the reality of what happens on the field. So um, the field observations uh, are based on our four main pillars uh, regarding the uh, forest, uh, regarding the uh, workers' rights, the transparency and the technology used to produce charcoal. And this is the uh, little document you see on the bottom left, uh, the CCS report. So this is our charcoal control system we do every time we visit a plant, every time we visit a farm where charcoal is produced. We generate this kind of reports with some percentages attributed to these four big pillars, and we get a final score for the field observations. The second segment is based on the transparency uh, the different charcoal producers show when they go on the CTI and when they uh, fill the charcoal transparency survey. This is a survey we send every year and uh, we want the uh, charcoal players uh, enter the, uh, this, uh, this survey. So it's based on uh, 30 different questions you can fill online and also an Excel file with giving you the, uh, I would say basic supply, basic but very important supply chain information from the wood source 
through the um, the uh, carbonization plant and even the uh, packing uh, packing site. And the last one is, uh, as I said, uh, the uh, carbon score uh, given with the CCFF method that we that we give for each bag. So how we calculate the global score from A++ to E, you have the different shares on the right of your screen showing uh, the most responsible products. A++ are the ones who have a global score of 95%, more than 95%. And then, as you can see, there is a big range between uh, the uh, 75 and, 90 and 100%. And, uh, and the, the last one for the E products, they are below uh, 30%. So this is to be transparent with you with how we uh, calculate the scores and the percentage behind that. So a little change also in terms of uh, aesthetic. Uh, now on the comparison uh, page, you can compare all the different charcoal bags that have been registered and entered into the CTI. And you have these three different big pillars giving you the scores of the field observation transparency carbon that you can filter and also giving you the uh, the global score uh, on the on the right of the screen and as i said uh, generally speaking the uh, the best scores i mean the uh, the green ones from a to b um, are I've filled almost all the different elements we've asked in terms of transparency. I've been visited also, and uh, I've been given also a high score in terms of performance for all the uh, four different components that I just explained, and I have the opportunity to communicate to the consumers the product story of the of the charcoal bag. So um, within a given QR code that you can print on the charcoal bag, you can follow all the steps of the production, which has led this charcoal bag into your hands from uh, the wood source and to the, uh, the production plant, the packing site. And uh, we also communicate on the evaluation we have conducted uh, to uh, on this charcoal bag. The charcoal transparency survey is also an important first step when uh, a member or uh, um, a charcoal player is coming uh, to us. It's very, the, the, the first steps uh, giving us the uh, major information. So um, it's an open uh, survey to fill. Uh, it's a really voluntary step to do by the, uh, by the industry, but this is a very necessary first step for us because it shows also the the, the will of the uh, of the company to to communicate about the uh, about the supply chain information so um this is this uh, famous uh, survey uh, with the uh, 30 different questions with the uh, excel file to upload uh, so once all the information have been declared and the uh, and the information upload on our site we uh, assess the different elements we have. Uh, we communicate also with the uh, the company if there are some missing elements, and then we get a score. And this transparency score um, is also uh, based on on different uh, elements we assessed. And uh, finally, after the assessment, we publish this uh, this score on the platform. And we try to uh, to pursue our uh, our um, work on the field in order to give uh, the uh, the field observations assessment. Another big news also for us uh, will be uh, this year to uh, to have the uh, Spanish version of the CTI. So uh, it's a, it's a big step also because it's always uh, good to uh, to populate this platform and uh, and to go uh, on different markets and uh, so spain is also a big market for charcoal so uh, this is a this is a very good news for us um i don't know if pierre you want to add something about the uh, the cti but uh, we can we can keep on no no perfect uh, just just what that also the spanish version is um merci merci antoine is also uh, to uh, also address the issue all related to uh, exactly uh, south america and also potentially cuba and there is also possibility for for cuba to communicate also on this platform and um, and spain is also an area where where there are also 
a significant range of improvements related to the charcoal production itself, as uh, Spain, uh, there is almost no technology reducing Paris gases in Spain, and, uh, and it can contribute to, to climate change. So, so that's also why we decided to add this new uh, country. Um, I know, we are almost, we are almost uh, with the conclusion. I just wanted here to, to, to talk and to give you some information about the work we do. Thanks to a member, uh, we had the opportunity to meet a lot of uh, European institutions over the recent, uh, over the recent months. Uh, as mentioned, we addressed the um, the charcoal footprint estimation to the European uh, Commission. We had the opportunity to, to, to talk with, to them and to address the issue, to tell them that um, namely there was two problems why the charcoal was not included into the European Union timber regulation or the law for imported deforestation. First one was it was difficult to have the traceability. So we tried to demonstrate with all our experience in the field that it's possible to have traceability or transparency, first element. Uh, and second element is that the potentially charcoal may have a significant impact on uh, forest degradation and deforestation. Um, second, second element is we also have a lot of meeting with the European member uh, of uh, the, European, uh, the, the European Parliament and also of the Environment Commission. And we also had uh, many uh, meetings with uh, member states. As we speak now today, today, under the presidency of France, on the 28th of, uh, 28th of June, the member states are gathering together to talk and to potentially integrate charcoal into the annex of uh, this law for imported deforestation. It's not yet done, but I would say that it's a big step forward. Then it will be, uh, it will go to a lot of different, uh, uh, there will be a lot of different meetings, a lot of different aspects uh, at the European Parliament level and also at the European Commission level. But let's say that's, that's the first take I wanted to share to, with you today. Uh, next slide, please Antoine. The second element we wanted to share as a conclusion and also as a, as a way to, uh, to, um, to open a little bit, uh, the, the, to give a little bit of perspective of uh, what will be the future of the, the charcoal program is also that uh, in taking into account uh, and taking in, in, inspiration from what have been done at this, uh, with at Earthworm um, on the soil program, uh, uh, we will launch a charcoal manifesto in order to ask for uh, to all European big buyers to commit to be engaged to limit imported deforestation related to charcoal. So the uh, the timing is the following: first, we will communicate the charcoal manifesto in July. Then we will ask for signature. During, during the summer. And then beginning of, of autumn, uh, we will do some, uh, if planning will be respected, I hope so, so uh, some co public communication for that. Um, and I'm going to conclude, and I take this opportunity to conclude to, uh, I'm just going to conclude and after the, the conclusion, just at the end, I will uh, give, uh, give uh, you an announcement. Uh, so first, uh, we, uh, in this uh, meeting, regular meeting, we, we try to show you that uh, charcoal can be a driver of forest degradation and can have an impact on climate change. Uh, we also consider that really retailers leverage Will it change the market? Huh? And thanks to the help of other NGO like WWF, who address the issue, who address the charcoal box analysis, and uh, and also the retailers engagement. So it drives positive change. Yet, uh, and the charcoal market is also mature, and the charcoal industry can really make some step forward. And we really believe that 
now the it's time to uh, have um, the charcoal entering into uh, the new law for imported deforestation. So on the next slide, uh, I'm just going to share some recommendations. Uh, that's a, those are the basic recommendations, repeat regularly, but uh, this recommendation will be also will be also integrate. Uh, we integrate some of the new changes we, we give. Uh, so for instance, the first one is that on the charcoal transparency, you may have now the opportunity to look at the carbon footprint of your charcoal product. So as buyer, you may select the one that have best score. Second aspect is all the buyers, all the traders, importer, producer, we encourage them to keep on doing efforts to limit greenhouse gas emission related to charcoal production. Second element, and we, we had this discussion in the Q&A, uh, the first session of Q&A with uh, Johanna Salen, is that we also encourage certification body to keep on doing some progress. A lot of have been done, yet it's not perfect yet. Still, uh, transparency needs to be reinforced also at the certification bodies. So we want to insist on that. Element, very important one, and repeat, we do it every year. We repeat, please write on your charcoal bag the wood species, the real origin of the product, the product, exact location of the production. Why? Because it can have a significant impact to reduce imported deforestation. When we did the bags analysis, we considered that the level of transparency is, is still too low. It's still too low, even if a lot of members are being engaged in doing good progress. It's still too low to drive really strong change. And, um, and, uh, and also, uh, one last point is really, we really recommend a charcoal to be included uh, within the new law for imported deforestation.